Today at the National Press Club, Yanis Yarifakis, author, academic economist and Greece's former finance minister. He now leads the European Realistic Disobedience Front. Yanis Yarifakis with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to today's National Press Club Westpac Address coming to you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. My name is Anna Henderson. I'm the Chief Political Correspondent for SBS World News and a director here at the club. Our guest today is Yanis Varoufakis, who has a pretty extraordinary resume. He's asked me to truncate it, but we have to step it out a little. Academic, economist, best-selling author, parliamentarian, political leader, Greece's former finance minister. He has spent time working as an academic in Australia and as finance minister was credited as the negotiator on the debt crisis with the European Union. His latest book is Techno-Feudalism, in which he contends that capitalism is dead. Today we will hear more about his concerns about the future of Europe and Australia and the fears of a slide into irrelevance because of ties with United States policy. You can follow the conversation at Press Club Ost or hashtag NPC. Please welcome Yanis Varoufakis. Thank you very much. Uh, it is with a deep sense of obligation and duties to the custodians, to the owners of this land on which we're meeting, the Nanawal people, that I pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and future. And in particular, and not just because last week we marked International Women's Day, I would like to um, mention the leading role of women, the women of the First Nations, as uh, custodians of uh, sophisticated and complex knowledge, as community organizers, and I think very importantly, as beacons of wisdom, especially for those of us who suffer from a masculine condition. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, today I'm looking forward to discussing with you uh, several thoughts, ideas and concerns uh, with a view to reclaiming for on behalf of Europe and Australia a shared future in a world which is changing, a world in which both U Europe and Australia are becoming increasingly irrelevant. And to do so, I must add that, not merely as a European or Greek politician, but also a proud citizen of, of, of Australia. Europe and Australia are facing a common predicament, an existential threat, a creeping irrelevance which is due to two reasons. Firstly, we have invested far too little for far too long. And secondly, we have allowed ourselves to go along an ill-considered slide from strategic dependence on the United States to a non-strategic, self-defeating servility to Washington's agenda. Our present moment in Europe and Australia has been shaped by three different important post-war phases. The first phase was the Bretton Woods system from 1944 to 1971. America exited the Second World War as the only creditor country, the only surplus country. Bretton Woods was a remarkable recycling mechanism, uh, and in effect a dollar zone that was founded on uh, fixed exchange rates, sustained by capital controls, and directed on the back of America's gigantic, at the time, trade surplus. With quasi-free trade being part of the deal, Washington dollarized Europe, Japan, and Australia as part of a deal, the purpose of which was to create aggregate demand for all those products coming out of the production lines of the manufacturing sector of the United States, which had become so remarkably productive and efficient during the war economy. Subsequently, 
the United States trade surplus operated like a vacuum cleaner, hoovering out of our countries the dollars they had, they had sent us through their net exports. The result was 20 years of um, high growth, low unemployment, low inflation, beautifully boring banking, <laughs> dwindling inequality, but alas, that golden era of capitalism, the Bretton Woods system, was dead in the water the moment the United States slipped from being a surplus country to a country with a very large trade deficit. The second phase was marked by the violent reversal of this recycling mechanism. The United States became the first hegemon in the history of humanity that increased its hegemony by boosting its trade deficit, by going further into the red. Operating like a, another powerful vacuum cleaner, the burgeoning American trade deficit hoovered up the world's net exports. And how did America pay for these imports? With dollars, which it also hoovered up from the rest of the world, as German, Japanese, and later Chinese capitalists sent to Wall Street more than 70% of their profits for recycling in Wall Street in the form of treasuries, government debt, real estate, shares, and of course, later on, the infamous derivatives. This audacious inverted recycling system founded on America's deficits required ever increasing, increasing American deficits in order to, to remain stable. In the process, it gave rise to growth rates even faster than those under the Bretton Woods system. However, it also gave rise to gigantic macroeconomic macro and financial imbalances, as well as mind-numbing levels of inequality. The new era came complete with an ideo ideology, remember neoliberalism, with uh, um, a policy of letting finance rip, financialization, and a false sense of dynamic equilibrium. Remember the great moderation, which was built, of course, on uh, hugely immoderate imbalances. Almost inevitably, on the back of this perpetual tsunami of capital, rushing in from the rest of the world to Wall Street, financiers fashioned gargantuan pyramids of complex derivatives, what Warren Buffett referred to as weapons of mass financial destruction. They went off, and we had the GFC, the global financial crisis. Capitalism and Wall Street were saved by the G7 central banks who pr that printed between April 2009, April 2009 and last year. They printed all the G7 central banks together around 35 trillion American dollars. That was one reason capitalism was saved. The second was China. China directed half its national income to say, investment, and in so doing, replaced a lot of the lost aggregate demand, not just domestically in China, but also in the United States, in Germany, in Australia. The third period, the third phase, is more recent. I call it the era of techno-feudalism, and that's the book that you kindly mentioned. I believe that this third era took root in the mid-2000s, but grew strongly after the GFC in conjunction with a rapid technological change that caused capital to mutate into a new form. I call it cloud capital. It's what lives inside your phone, inside your laptop. It's an automated means of behavioral modification. Consider the six things that cloud capital does where do you encounter it? When you go into Amazon.com, when you go into Uber. The six things that cloud capital does, it grabs our attention, first. It manufactures our desires. Third, it sells directly to us the things that will satiate the desires that it has manufactured. Fourth, it drives and monitors workers in the workplace, whether the workplace is a factory, an Amazon warehouse, or the cab of a truck 
in which a driver monitored by the same algorithm works. Fifth, it elicits massive free labor from all of us every time we click, we like, or we post whatever we do on the internet. And finally, it provides the potential for blending seamlessly all that with digital payments. Is it any wonder that the owners of this cloud capital, I call them cloud lists. <laughs> is it any wonder that these cloud lists have hitherto undreamt of power? They are already a new ruling class. If you look at the capitalization of the seven cloud list firms in the United States, also known as the Magnificent Seven, you'll find that their capitalization of those seven firms is larger than the cap capitalization of every listed company in the following countries. United Kingdom, France, Japan, Canada, and China taken together. Where did the money come for so much cloud capital to accumulate? Where did, the, where did all this investment come from? Remember the $35 trillion that the G7 central banks produced after the GFC? That's where the money came. One example, nine out of $10 invested by Zuckerberg in Facebook came from central bank money. So the issue, ladies and gentlemen, is not what will AI do to us in the future. The issue is what it has already done to us. And now a question of immense importance to Europe and to Australia. In which countries is cloud capital concentrated? In the United States and in China. Nowhere else. Hold that thought, I'll come back to it. First, let's say a few words about Europe. Most of you will know me as the failed finance minister of the most bankrupt state in Europe. <laughs> Though I take solace that some people here in Canberra, including one or two government ministers, remember me as their Sydney University economics lecturer. <laughs> in my defense, and lest we forget, the reason why I was elected to the finance minister in 2015 was because we had a catastrophic, cataclysmic collapse, not just of Greece, but the whole of the Eurozone, the whole of the European Union's banking sector, and then a domino effect, with Greece being simply the canary in the mine. The reason why Europe was so severely damaged by the GFC was the ludicrous monetary architecture that we had erected. We had a monetary union that had a central bank without a treasury to have its back, and we had 19 treasuries without the central bank to have their back while they were trying to bail out 19 separate banking systems that were all bankrupt. In short, even if European governments wanted, after 2008, to emulate the sensible response to the GFC of the RAD administration, of the RAD government, we simply lacked the institutions to do it in Europe. And the result? The result was the European doom loop between banking losses, stagnation, unpayable public and private debts, and an investment strike lasting a quarter of a century. The result of which today is Europe's, and in particular Germany's, deindustrialization. Quarter of a century later, whereas once 25 years ago we had a debilitating north-south divide in Europe, now we also have an east-west divide, in addition to the north-south divide. While the essential fiscal and political union that Europe needs is further away from the horizon than ever. The European Union's so-called Green Deal is uh, honored in the breach, not in the implementation. Europe's industries are falling behind their competitors in the United States and China in every technological race that matters, particularly green technology and green energy. And our continent lacks cloud capital in the age of techno-feudalism, where power stems from owning copious amounts of cloud capital, the capital that only the United States and China possess. In my intro introduction, I said, controversially, I hope, that Europe and Australia are facing irrelevance and marginalization. Two other reasons. One, 
neither Europe nor Australia possess sufficient quantities of cloud capital. It's a bit like trying to make your way in the 19th century without steam engines and locomotives. And the second reason is the new Cold War, which is upending Europe's and Australia's business model. Speaking of the new Cold War, almost a year ago, in this prestigious institution, Paul Keating lambasted the Albanese government for making their own call in allowing Australia to become complicit in Washington's pursuit of that new Cold War against Australia's interests. The one question that Paul Keating did not ask was, why is Washington doing this? What is behind, what lies behind the new Cold War? Why did President Trump kickstart this confrontation with the banning of Huawei and ZT and then the aluminum tariffs. And please don't say that that's what Trump does because Joe Biden, who was supposed to be the anti-Trump, gets elected and what does he do? He turbocharges that Cold War by declaring economic warfare against Beijing because that is what you do when you say you are not going to be allowed to import advanced microchips. When I ask this question in the United States amongst my friends there, I get two answers as to the rationale behind the new Cold War. One is Taiwan, the escalating military threat to international trade um, by the Chinese government. Taiwan and escalation. I'm afraid I remain depressingly unconvinced. I wish I could have been convinced. Ever since Nixon went to China, and during the long period when Washington was uh, strong arming Australia, Europe, to accept China in the World Trade Organization in the circuits of international capitalism, it was very clear that the one China policy was a given that Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan was never contested by the West. So what has changed? As for China's military threat, I'm afraid that on this I'm with Malcolm Fraser when he opined once that we will only be able to talk about uh, a provocation of the Chinese military when Chinese Navy ships anchored just outside the San Diego base of the US Navy in the United States or outside Norfolk, Virginia. And please, can someone explain to me the rationale behind the accusation that China is threatening international shipping routes when China is a country that depends entirely on a current account surplus and importing energy? Why would they ever want to jeopardize international shipping routes? No, ladies and gentlemen, the new Cold War is neither due to Taiwan nor to China. The answer lies this is my hypothesis, in cloud capital. America's hegemony since 1971 is built on its trade deficit, which is a paradox. And that, however, relies entirely on its capacity to maintain its monopoly over international dollar-denominated payments. That is what allows the United States to make the rest of the world pay for its deficits. But Chinese cloud capital has already achieved something that the dollar system has not achieved and cannot achieve. It has seamlessly integrated cloud capital with financial services. For example, take WeChat, an application that is provided by Chinese conglomerate Tencent. It allows you, or allows anyone who has a one account to make free payments anywhere. Free payments, independently of where they bank. That is not available in Australia in Europe, in the United States. Similarly, the digital currency of the Central Bank of China. Why is there no American equivalent to this? It's really very simple. Because Wall Street will not allow it. Wall Street refuses to share financial rents either with the West Coast Silicon Valley cloud elites or with the Federal Reserve. And there's the rub. America still maintains its dominance over international payments Payments that are traveling along 
a rickety dollar highway full of potholes and technological backwardness, which nevertheless remains the highway of choice for global money. Meanwhile, Chinese cloud capital has built, has constructed an all singing, all dancing payment superhighway, denominated in one, that very few use. But this superhighway's very existence is a clear and present danger to the American monopoly of the dollar payment system on which America's hegemony rests, especially after the war in Ukraine created jitters amongst oligarchs from Saudi Arabia to Indonesia to the Philippines and some in Europe as well who started using that superhighway, fearing that their monies may be confiscated at some point. In short, the new Cold War has nothing to do with trade routes, Taiwan, or Chinese escalation. It is rather the manifestation of a dangerous clash between two techno-feudal systems, one denominated in dollars, the other in Chinese one. So, if I'm right, the question becomes, what should Australia do in this topsy-turvy world, which is increasingly techno-feudal? At the domestic front, first, we, and I say we, because I am the proud carrier of an Australian passport, as I said. <laughs> the first thing we must do is must, we must ditch the old rentier business model of banking on holes and homes because this old model of Australia is now a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme whose maintenance will result in a country marred by minimal investment in the things that matter, low productivity, debilitating inequality, high inflation, and low wages, pushing the talented people of this country, especially the young, into a low innovation sinkhole. Instead, we should adopt in this country a Green New Deal for Australia as a necessity, not as a luxury. Let me give you an example. Europe is about to introduce a border adjustment carbon tax. America surely will follow. So will others. So Australia must end its dependence on dirty fossil fuels and unrefined minerals and let rip on solar, solar power and wind, but primarily solar, to do what with it? to produce green hydrogen, to do what with it? Not to export it, but to use it domestically in a new manufacturing sector, intermediate manufacturing sector, that refines copper, cobalt, nickel into green copper, copper, green cobalt, green steel, and then transport it and export it to Asia, where the batteries will be manufactured, that will go into the electric vehicles that will be sold to Europe and to the rest of the world as green technology. That, I think, is the future for an Australia that participates in the international division of green labor. But for that to happen, this country needs a massive injection of public investment. The private sector will not do it. Nothing short of a latter-day 1950s snowy scheme is necessary here. Second, acknowledge that it has never been more dismal to be young in this country. Reverse the absurdity of the Australian government collecting more money from HEX than it does from the petroleum resource rent tax. <laughs> tax rents properly to make higher education free again. and negative gearing, and in particular, the egregious, inane capital gains exemption of a real estate investment. <laughs> tax those with concentrated power to set prices, and tax them through the nose. <laughs> and move away from the mentality of tax cuts as something which is clever and good. It is neither clever nor good. <laughs> you care about the youth? Build social housing. Because social housing has a twin effect. 
Firstly, it benefits those who take it. Secondly, by increasing supply, it reduces or caps the inflation in the prices of private homes. So everybody benefits. That's the second thing I would do. The third, since Australian capitalists cannot compete with the big tech, the cloud lists of the west coast of the United States or of China, it is the role of the Australian government in the same way that it once created the ABC or CSIRO, it is the role of the Australian government to put at the disposal of Australians important new technologies, to build up public cloud capital, beginning with a digital Australian dollar that the Reserve Bank of Australia can provide tomorrow. Essentially, a free checking account for every resident of this country based on your tax file number with a PIN number. Receiving on your deposits there, the interest rate provided by the Reserve Bank of Australia to those who already have accounts with them, the bankers, at the overnight rate. What about internationally? First, Australia must restore a reputation tainted by blindly following America into lethal adventures in Iraq and Afghanistan. And today, via its active and crucial complicity in Israel's deliberate war crimes in Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the West Bank. Bravo. Ladies and gentlemen, children are not starving in Gaza today. No, they are being deliberately, deliberately starved, without hesitation and without remorse. The famine in Gaza is not collateral damage. It is intentional policy, the purpose of which is to defeat a population and ultimately to root them out of that land. By lending credence to the notion that Israel is exercising the right to self-defense and by defunding on the basis of an unsubstantiated allegations, the only agency that can ameliorate the starvation in Gaza, Australia damaged its already wounded reputation. Reversing this decision is too little too late now. Just as there was a bipartisan campaign led by Malcolm Fraser and Bob Hawke to end South African apartheid against the wishes of Washington that supported the white supremacists in Pretoria. The Australian political class needs to lead a campaign to end apartheid in Israel-Palestine and to restore equal civil liberties to Israelis and to Palestinians. <laughs> this is the duty of every nation, but it is especially the duty of this one. Why? Because of the sorry history of Terra Nullius the white settlers' ideological cover for the genocide of the native populations, which was transported from British outposts like Australia to the land of Palestine and Israel, with the banner, a land without a people for a people without a land. That's Terra Nullius. Second, Australia has a duty to de-escalate the new Cold War. I've already made this point, but I need to make it once more. To understand that this can only be done if Australia ends its servility to the United States, a United States that is actively creating threats that then makes us pay through the nose to be protected from. Imagine an Australia that helps bring a just peace in Ukraine, as opposed to a mindless forever war that is going nowhere. A non-aligned Australia that is never neutral in the face of injustice, but also not automatically aligned with every warmongering adventure decided by its allies. Imagine an Australia which, has, which having re-established its credentials as a country that thinks and acts on its own behalf, engages with China in a spirit of peaceful cooperation, a far better way of addressing Beijing's increasing authoritarianism towards its own people, than buying useless, hyper-expensive submarines that only succeed in forcing China's political class to close ranks around an authoritarian core. Yeah. 
Imagine a truly patriotic Australian Prime Minister who tells the American President to cease and desist from the slow murder of my friend Julian Assange. From, for what? For the crime of journalism. For exposing to American citizens the crimes that their government and our governments have perpetrated behind our backs in our name. In the end, that will make for a better friendship with the United States because, believe you me, one of the few things I've learned while I was in office, that short period of time, American power brokers appreciate you more if you can say no to them. They appreciate, they would appreciate an independently minded Australia more than they appreciate today's Australia. In the same way you appreciate a friend who tells you you're wrong when you're wrong, rather than say yes to everything you do and then whinge behind your back. <laughs> to conclude, if Europe and Australia are to escape gross irrelevance, we need separate but well-coordinated Green New Deals, one for Europe and one for Australia. But none of that is going to work. In a world buffeted by an uncontrollable new Cold War that threatens the green transition, which is necessary to preserve the viability of our species. To have a future, Europe and Australia must end our mindless slide from strategic dependence on the United States to improvised, impulsive, inexpedient servility to the United States. DiEM25, our pan-European movement, is working towards this goal, especially now in view of the European Parliament elections in the coming June. In the last fortnight, while I was here in Australia, uh, during this visit, I was thrilled to discover many talented Australians full of wonderful ideas of how to do this in this country, as well as effective organizations dedicated to the same cause. Optimism is perhaps not yet empirically founded, but hope burns brightly. Thank you. Thank you for your address. I think one of the, the main issues that you've taken, taken up in your conversation here is around uh, how Australia is aligning itself with the United States on a military level. Just in the last week, our Foreign Minister Penny Wong was again warning of destabilising, provocative and coercive action by China. Is there a risk that you're actually blind to the defence reality in the region in how you're framing this debate? And what do you say to those who see your position as quite naive on this because of the realities of different defence superpowers and their military build-up and the economics behind that. Was there a Chinese vessel entering territorial waters in Australia, in Japan, in the United States? None of that. So the only risk here is that we will allow somebody like the foreign minister to get away with subterfuge and by creating a false perspective on a threat which is not there. The Chinese people have every reason to fear their government. If you are a student at the Hong Kong Polytechnic, you are terrorized by a very authoritarian regime. If you're a Muslim, you have difficulties in particular provinces as we very well know in China. Uh, my friends and comrades in uh, China feel that there is an increasing authoritarian noose around their neck. That is a threat, and we need to help Chinese Democrats and Chinese progressives and some Chinese socialists. We need to help them liberate themselves from that noose. But we are not going to do it by allowing Penny Wong and other warmongers to create a false sense that China is threatening Australia when that is not the case in order to weaponize a particular defensive military-industrial complex motivated policy, which in the end is the best gift you can make to the elements of the Chinese Communist Party who use this clear mis 
representation of the situation in the Pacific in order to clamp down on their own people. Our next question is from Tom Connell. Tom Connell uh, on the board here and also from Sky News. Thank you for your speech. Um, I want to go back to 2015 when President Xi Jinping was in the White House with Obama and he pledged not to militarise the South China Sea, the islands there. He then went and did that. Isn't that a threat that emanated from the Chinese side, a change in what they said they'd do that needed to be responded to? In a similar way, China's made no secret of wanting bases that happen to be close to Australia and the Pacific. Aren't they real risks and threats that do need responding to? Debate how you do it, but they do need responding to? Whenever in the diplomatic sphere there's backtracking, there has to be a diplomatic language for responding to it, and sometimes some action when in, in terms of, of um, some military maneuvers that are proportional to the threat. But allow me to pose the question slightly differently. What happened with Europe and NATO's expansion after all the successive pledges that there would be no expansion of NATO, pledges to Yeltsin, to Putin, which were completely and utterly violated by the West. That, does that justify Putin's weaponization of this particular violation of pledges in order, in the end, even to invade Ukraine? I don't think so. So proportional responses, yes. Do I have a problem with militarization? I do. Do I believe that the answer to the militarization of particular islands in the South China Seas is essentially to turbocharge a new Cold War that destroys our business model and which essentially, the only thing it does, it solidifies the power base of the particular segment of the Communist Party in Beijing which you consider to be the source of the violation of that trust. I don't believe so. In other words, let's keep our heads. Let's maintain diplomatic proportionality. And certainly, let's not have $368 billion spent on submarines, which are completely useless to Australia, that will do nothing, nothing to ameliorate those threats that you're talking about, and which the the, 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 the seller to Australia has a button that can press and suddenly, like a Tesla car, can be switched off by Elon Musk at will. You are not going to be able to use your submarines for the purposes of Australia's defensive, de de defensive moves. Our next question comes from Julie Hare. Julie here from the Australian Financial Review. Thank you so much for your speech. Um, you speak about the new cloud capital, um, mm -hmm. cloud capitalism, I don't know, um, and the new ruling class. Um, you talk about the GFC being a pivotal point in the development of yes. that. Could you please explain to us how the GFC played the role in, this, in the development of this new capital? It paid for it. The GFC caused our great and good leaders to congregate in London in April 2009 in a state of panic, naturally, because the whole system was going pear-shaped. Uh, and they decided to refloat finance. Between that April of 2009, under the chairmanship of Gordon Bryan, if you remember, who was Prime Minister of Britain at the time, uh, till last year, they printed $35 trillion. Now, at the same time, they were practicing austerity in Europe, in Britain, even in the United States, despite Obama's alleged stimulus program. What happens when you pump huge quantities of freshly minted monies into the financial system? It's full of liquidity. It's drowning in liquidity. And you have austerity in the real economy. What happens is the Bank of America or Deutsche Bank or Citigroup, they pick up the phone, they call an industrialist, British Aerospace or uh, you know, General Electric, and say, I've got 500 million, I'll give it to you for free, zero interest rate, will you take it? 
Now, if you're GE, right, you look around and you see no demand for your products. You already have cash, which you are too scared to invest. But you still get it from zero for zero interest rate. You say, yes, give it to me. But you don't invest it. What you do is you go to the stock exchange and you buy back your own shares. The share price goes up, your bonus goes up, no investment. The only firms that actually invested in capital were the cloud delists, the Zuckerbergs, huh? and the Googles, and so on and so forth. This is why I'm saying, this is my hypothesis, or thesis if you want, that our central banks paid for the explosion in the quantity and therefore the quality in the final analysis of cloud capital. What would have happened if austerity, if, they, if they'd you know, gone towards austerity as opposed to what you're describing here? Well, let's say that they, instead of giving it to the bankers, they, the central banks were to go in association with a public investment bank to put money into green tech. Well, in Europe, we wouldn't be dependent on Putin's Gazprom the way we were once he invaded Ukraine. We would have had, we would have had good quality jobs, same in the United States. We wouldn't have had Trump. We wouldn't have had the alternative for Deutschland because all these neo-fascists, this is what I call them, right? Because I'm too old and tired to try to find <laughs> polite terms. Uh, all these neo-fascists grew up because they surfed the wave of discontent caused by the combination of socialism for the bankers and austerity for everyone else. Thank you. Paul Karp. Paul Karp from The Guardian, thanks very much for your speech. Um, many of your domestic policy solutions like a Green New Deal uh, or cutting housing tax concessions would be good for the environment and good for inequality, but I, I can't see how they would uh, do anything to prevent this techno-feudalism, um, the, the problem that you've described in your speech. Um, could I please ask, firstly, what do you think of more extreme policy solutions like the US breaking up big tech companies or Australia banning um, tech companies from collecting users' data? Uh, and secondly, do you think consumers would be keen to sign up to a government bank account, a government Uber and a government Amazon as an, a publicly owned alternative? Firstly, I did mention the importance of, for instance, the government in the same way that they created CSIRO and the ABC to create uh, a public cloud capital infrastructure which can be used either at the level of the state, for instance, the Reserve Bank providing you. Would you why don't you answer your own question? If the Reserve Bank of Australia gave you a digital wallet with a PIN number uh, and you, you, you could put your salary in there and make free payments to anyone, to anyone, huh? free payments, no fees, no questions asked, and you were to receive on your deposits the overnight interest rate of the Reserve Bank of Australia, would you say no to that? I, I can see how a public option You, you wouldn't say no better, to that. You would not say no to wouldn't that. The, wouldn't the collateralists still be hoovering up all my, all no, my no, data? No, hang on, no, 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 hang on. This is, public, this is public, pub, a public ledger. Mm -hmm. And you can have your Australian Parliament safeguard the anonymity of your payments and safeguard your privacy a lot better than the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. The NAB, of course, Westpac is ex excluded today. <laughs> uh, as for a, 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 a government Uber, I wouldn't want a government Uber. It would be ludicrous to have a, go a government Uber, but it would be brilliant if we had a cooperative of drivers with their own cloud capital, their own algorithm, so that they would retain, they would retain the rents and the proceeds from their customers rather than having them being skimmed off via Luxembourg, that's how Uber works, Ireland to the Cayman Islands, right? Uh, so I'm talking about a cooperative enterprise here that is assisted through legislation by the Australian Parliament. Um, and uh, finally, I agree with you entirely that we need a digital bill of rights so that we own our data, and more so than our data, it is high time that we own our digital identity. Because you and I have no way of proving who we are on the internet unless we beg, beg some conglomerate or bank to vouch for who we are. Because unlike the analog world where, you know, our states 
provide us with a driver's license or a passport, which proves who we are, and the internet, they don't. You have to beg Google to testify to who you are. So these small changes can make a very big difference. Our next question is from Balad Al Khaki. So, just here for the Australian Associated Press. You've included some suggestions about potential business models or technologies that can be useful, including a public cloud capital to counteract the concentration of power among tech giants. What hope can this give for small business owners in a cost of living crisis? Well, to begin with, the cost of living crisis. Uh, here is, is a double-edged sword because companies like Amazon or Walmart in the United States have an ideology of cheapness, but that cheapness in the end bites us on the backside because that cheapness means that all the value that is created by companies producing the stuff that is sold on their platforms is skimmed off from the producers and is siphoned off into the account of Jeff Bezos. And from there, it go, doesn't go anywhere, because if you have 200, $300 billion, I mean, if I give you another dollar, why, how can you spend it? You can't spend it even if you want to, right? Uh, so putting the lid on what Amazon can do is, in the end, through secondary and tertiary effects in the interests of the whole of the economy, including small businesses. But I would, as a first step, recommend, for instance, to the Australian government that it does what the Indonesian government does. Other governments, Turkey, slap a 5% cloud tax on digital purchases. Really very simple. You tax the purchase, huh, which is detrimental to the possibility that a small shop can trade without effectively trading through it a platform that will skim off whatever value it produces. And if you want to take this further, if you feel radical enough, uh, you can say to these uh, platforms that if you want to trade in this country, you're going to have to deposit 10% of your shares in our sovereign wealth fund, where the dividends accumulate and they are distributed to the people of Australia as a basic income or basic dividend, to be more precise. Our next question comes from Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross, Canberra IQ. Um, uh, cloud capitalism. Um, you're basically talking about the, uh, the digitalisation of so much of what we do um, in, in commerce and in dealing with the government. Um, and you're um, uh, seeing average citizens as victims. I just want to relate this to Greece. Uh, when you had the big, big financial problem, one of the things we got to learn was uh, uh, the uh, high level of tax evasion and tax avoidance that, that is, that is the, like a national sport in Greece. Um, and uh, last, last month, the IMF came out with this, uh, this report about recent trends of informality in Greece. Mm -hmm. That's the term they use for the, the tax avoidance evasion. And um, uh, they say that uh, the digitalisation is a major factor that helped reduce informality in Greece. So can you just uh, extemporise a bit about uh, sure. the, um, the goods and the bads of this, uh, uh, the digitalisation of our lives? I'm all for digitalisation. I love okay. technology. I'm not a Luddite or neo-Luddite. I don't want to smash the machines and go back to a bucolic lifestyle. As a finance minister, it was my intention effectively to ban cash, to make all transactions digital in order to do away with the problem of tax evasion. Uh, that wasn't very appreciated <laughs> by the vast like majority of tax evaders. Like but you see, the point I want to make, if yeah. I may, is this. My concept of cloud capital is not a critique of digitalization. It is a critique of the fact that 
we have particular companies that own so much cloud capital that can modify our behavior in such a way as to allow the owners of that digital capital or cloud capital to amass rents, which is another form of hypersonic tax evasion or evasion of everything. Because think of, Amazon pays no tax. You realize that? Zero. Yeah, well, it's, it's zero. It, it's zero. very dodgy stuff, yes. Zero. Okay? Zero. It's all legal. Zero. I'd probably say something different, but they'd of, probably well, be. Of course they would say something different. Like but, it wouldn't be as but, much as they should. Oh, be. I only need to state that they pay zero tax. Okay. Okay. Last year, I looked at the numbers. They had 46 billion uh, euros, 46 billion euros revenues in Europe, and they paid zero. Yeah. Okay? Now, whatever you tell me, I'm not convinced that they had no profits. Okay? <laughs> and they paid zero. Okay. So digitalization is not a solution to tax evasion when the whole value chain is being taken to the Cayman Islands by okay. Jeff Bezos. So yes to digitalization, but at the same time we need to take over the ownership of these chunks of cloud capital that allows them to create a series of different problems, so not just the tax over. evasion. You say take over, what do you mean? Well, for instance, I gave the example before of how an alternative Uber could operate. A cooperative which belongs to the workers, to the drivers, and they have the algorithm. It is part of the capital of the cooperative. And then you have digitization of the taxi service, but it doesn't go to the Cayman Islands. It does not create circumstances of psychological despair amongst the drivers, and it doesn't exploit your data the way that Uber does. That's an example. Socialization of the algorithm, not nationalization. Okay. Tony Melville. Tony Melville, director of the National Press Club. I wasn't going to talk about tax evasion, but one of my favourite, maybe apocryphal Greek stories was when a tax was introduced on swimming pools, there was a huge sale of tarpaulins as people covered up their backyards. <laughs> <laughs> to the, it could be apocryphal. But uh, my question goes back to your comment about um, being the, uh, and I quote you, the uh, failed finance minister, former finance minister of the most bankrupt state in Europe. Yep. There's a Quite a big Greek community here today, and how about something positive about Greece in terms of how the economy is going there? I'm not going to indulge in <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> okay, you want something positive? Yeah. I'll say it in Greek and then I'll translate. Η Ελλάδα ποτέ δεν πεθαίνει. That is, I'll translate. Greece cannot be killed. It's very hard to kill. Right? Nick Stewart. Most of the people here today have paid for their, their lunches using credit cards. Mm. Everyone is using credit cards all the time. As you pointed out, the Reserve Bank of Australia has actually looked at and investigated, although we haven't seen any results of their investigation, into they, they've looked at the possibility of introducing some alternative form yeah, of, of yeah, transaction. Yeah. Um, at the moment, one between one and three percent of all Australia's GDP is effectively going overseas Indeed. to to a number of multinationals. Yeah. What can we do now? Why vote don't... for politicians who have what it takes <laughs> to introduce it? What if you can't find any? Uh, uh... Well, you, then you run. <laughs> Then you create them. <laughs> no, but seriously, 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 seriously. In China today, whatever you may think about China and the United States and all that, as we speak, there are 180 million digital wallets that already are running, and they are not just used by Chinese. I know German entrepreneurs who use them because they buy aluminium from Shenzhen, they bring it to Germany, they make propellers, for the shipyards in Shanghai, and then they send the, the propellers to Shanghai. Yeah? Instead of going to their bank managers in Deutsche Bank to send money to the Buddhist Bank, that goes to the European Central Bank, that goes to the Central Bank of China, that then goes to their private account uh, and makes a payment to get the aluminium, and then the whole process being reversed, 
Uh, they have a digital wallet provided by the Central Bank of China. They make the payment by just pressing one button, no fees, no questions asked. The money goes backwards and forwards. Why can the Chinese do this and we can't? It's not that the Reserve Bank of Australia can't do it or they have to look into it again and again. They can do it yesterday. The banks won't let them because they demand the monopoly of the payment system. And that is a scandal that they have it. Because, you know, if you ask an economic student, what, what is the role of a bank? They say, oh, they're intermediaries. They take deposits from Jill and they lend them to Jack. That's not what they do. That is a fiction. What they do is because in order to make a payment to have your lunch or to get a coffee from a coffee shop, you need to have a private account. Otherwise, there's, there's no card. Well, if the Reserve Bank gave them that card, then suddenly the banks would have to provide genuine services to their customers, something they do not want to do. <laughs> G Except G Westpac, of course. <laughs> Do, do you think Australian consumers would prefer to, to have that and actually reduce their, their fees rather than the Qantas points or other things like that? Well, to the extent that Australian consumers are not totally idiotic, yes. <laughs> We've got a few more questions to go. I, I just wanted to take you to one part of your address where you did speak about Australia, in your view, blindly following the US and... Uh, in my view, okay. And in terms of the way that you've raised that concern around the pausing of funding in, in Gaza, we do seek a variety of perspectives here at the Press Club, of course, to hear different sides of, you know, the viewpoints on these issues. Is it not important that countries like Australia and the many other countries who have also taken pause on that funding to investigate when those kinds of issues are raised? Of course, investigate to your heart's content. But don't stop feeding the starving while you're investigating. You would never have done that in any other part of the world. Of course, everything needs to be investigated. But you know what? We're missing the point. The point is that as we speak, there are people who are bombed and people who are starved. And Australia is whistling in the wind. And that is not good for Australia's image in the whole wide world, in the global south, but also in the global north, amongst the youngsters who in 10 years' time will be the decision makers and who, even the United States, are appalled by this complicity in so much suffering. Tom Connell again. again, I won't thank you for your speech again. I might just thank you for inspiring the uh, magnificent lamb lunch, uh, which was really good. Um, you've spoken about the power of big tech. Roosevelt, once upon a time, broke up big oil and big railway because they were bad for the country. Maybe big tech is still bad for the US, but they bring in so much mm. money. It's such a, a part of the share market. Probably not. China, a similar thing. So if they don't want it to happen, how would that play out if the rest of the world and countries sort of combine to try to bring or not or hobble big tech while the US and China want those companies to be as big as they are? Is that going to be a problem? Of course it's going to be a problem. Whenever you um, are faced with exorbitant power, you have an exorbitant problem. There's no doubt about that. What I'm saying is that we need to try it. But look, the, it is a mistake to think of the task at hand in the same way that we thought in the 1910s about trust busting. You know, Theodore Roosevelt famously and very courageously broke up Standard Oil, the Rockefeller's uh, monopoly. That was very difficult politically, but technically dead easy. Because there you had an oil company, petrol company, yeah, having all these petrol stations across the United States. It was one thing, one monolithic company, and what the government did was to say, OK, fine, we break it down to 50 companies, one per state. It's quite straightforward to do. You can't do this with Google. The whole point about Google is that it is universal, that you, <laughs> that you search. Yeah, how do you break up? You take YouTube away from, uh, from the, the, the Google search engine, the whole thing collapses. So I don't believe that the solution will come by emulating that which happened in the 1910s. We need a completely different approach. I think there are three steps that I, or four steps that I would recommend, or a number of, there are lots of things you can do, but it's not the old fashioned regulation. The first thing you need to do is um, impose interoperability. 
That is, at the moment, if you don't want to get out of Elon Musk's X or Twitter, as we mostly know it, um, you can't. You can't. There is blue sky. There are many alternatives, and there's technically, technologically, they are just as good or better. But I have a million followers on Twitter. If I leave and go to Blue Sky, I will not have even myself as my follower. It's a good Once problem to have. Hmm? It's a good problem to have. It's a good problem to have, maybe. Not if you want to, you know, to speak your mind, right? Seriously now. No, but imagine if you could actually to take your followers with you, which is what the telephone companies remember. A long, you're too young to remember. A long time ago, you could not ca take your telephone number, your mo mobile number, from Telstra to Optus, right? Until the government said, no, you can't. Now that is technically very easy to allow the transfer of a telephone number, to allow all your data that you have on Facebook to go somewhere else is another matter. So you can do that. You can have a digital bill, bill of rights so that if they use your data, they will have to pay you. Pennies, but pay you. Thirdly, what I said about the sovereign wealth fund, deposit um, shares there and therefore give the people of Australia, the Australian parliament, a say in uh, the meetings of the shareholders. These are more radical, but I think smarter approaches. Um, when it comes to, to the algorithms, you can have, you need to have, in the same way you have you know, the federal police, you can create a federal unit, the purpose of which is to work out subterfuge and illegality that has been implanted into algorithms. For instance, let me give you an example, right? When you are a publisher, newspaper, or whatever, a vendor in Amazon.com. At first, they lure you in by elevating you quite up there, and so you see a lot of trade. They bring you in, you do a lot and more, more and more and more trade on Amazon because you're making money. The moment they have caught you, right, they push you down. And then they blackmail you, and they say you have to pay us this amount of your revenue if you're going to be elevated again. That should be illegal. And there should be a way of simply taking these, these people to the cleaners. Thank you. Um, I understand that uh, techno-feudalism is, is a global phenomenon, but I'm wondering if there's a, nat a, natural, a natural system of politics that could all government to accompany techno-feudalism and just secondly, do you believe social democracy can survive the challenge of the rise of far-right parties, particularly in Europe? Well, it is a global phenomenon, uh, just like capitalism was a global phenomenon. But that doesn't mean that it is the same everywhere. Like capitalism was not the same everywhere. You know? Chile, Sweden, Australia, Poland, they're all capitalist countries, but very different within capitalism. Similarly, uh, Techno-feudalism in, in China is different to techno-feudalism in America, and one difference is the fact that um, I made the point about payment systems, which in China are far more efficient because the finances do not control what the big tech does in China. Um, the, 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 the second point was? Uh, the, the second question was actually about social democracy. Social, social democracy, democracy and the rise of right. Look, I have right a very, right. very sad view about this, very depressing view. I think social democracy died a long time ago and we didn't notice it. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Social de what was social democracy? It was the political project of governments bringing together the representatives of industrial capital, of the factories, and the trade unions and cutting a deal between them, saying to the factory owners, OK, you will have industrial peace. We will be off your case. But a chunk of your profits, of your surplus value, will go to the state to fund Medicare. Another chunk will go to workers for them to have a decent life. Okay? But after the end of Bretton Woods, we had a situation where the economic sphere split up, divided and multiplied between the industrial sphere and the financial sphere. So finance effectively broke off, created its own realm. And power moved from the industrial manufacturing sector to the banking sector. Once that happened, and especially with deindustrialization everywhere, 
in the United States, in Britain, here. Huh? All the factories went. Even, even if you are the Australian Prime Minister or the British Prime Minister or the American President, who do you, do you bring around the table? The head of Goldman Sachs and the trades union, what, of, tra of nurses? What conversation can you have at that point? That's why I'm saying that, you, and the reason why you see the waning of social democracy, you know, the dim diminishing of the ambition of the ALP, uh, where effectively the ALP said, okay, look, we'll get out of this. No awards, no collective bargaining agreements. Uh, we'll, we'll just introduce minimum wage and look after workers through the pension system or superannuation. That's the end of social democracy. The, this, this idea of um, a kind of uh, grand bargain, a great contract between capital and labor has gone a long time ago. And the GFC killed it off completely. And now techno-feudalism has made it a figment of our imagination. I don't know whether to thank you for that or not, but anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, look, we'd just like to thank you very much for your time today. A <laughs> Uh, and uh, give you a warm thank you from the group. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified when we publish a new one. See you next time.